Okay, so today we're going to be breaking down a severe head trauma patient uh, that we gave you this morning, and it was a pretty uh, significant head trauma, and we're going to talk about uh, head trauma in a very broad perspective today, so that way we can kind of get an idea of how we can manage these patients, even if we have multi-trauma, which is a common thing when we have head injuries in combination with other trauma that's going on. So that's what we're going to be breaking down today. So remember, before we get started, if you don't know who we are, my name is Jeff, I'm with Master Medics. I own Master Medics and we've created a learning management system that's specifically built for paramedic students and EMT students that are struggling in school that are getting prepared for their exams. And so if you love the way that we do education, this is how we do things, very visual, very enjoyable. And if you'd love to join us, please feel free to do that on a free three-day trial. Check us out. If you love it, you can stay as long as you like. If it's not for you, you can cancel anytime. And then of course, we do have continuing education that is approved and accredited as well. So if you're a practitioner that wants to learn this way, we have stuff for you as well. So please join us there. We would love to see you. Okay, so let's break this case down. So you're called to a 28 year old female patient who was hit by a car while walking across the street. You find the patient unconscious, unresponsive, laying prone. You do a primary survey and you don't find any remarkable, anything remarkable with the exception of a significant laceration to the occiput region of the patient's head. This is the back portion of the head. You can see that here with a significant amount of blood. Okay, so this is the presentation of your patient. You saw the blood already. She got hit by a car while walking across the street and this is what you find. Some multiple scratches, multiple lacerations all over, but nothing significant with the exception of the head injury. Okay, so let go, let's go into the vital signs. So this is what you find as far as your vital signs. You have a heart rate of 43, you have a blood pressure of 208 on 110 with a MAP of 142, you have an ETCO2 of 60 with a breathing rate of six, and you have an SpO2 currently of 84%. Okay, so based off this, these vital signs, what vital signs are you concerned about? What are some things that are popping out to you that are concerning to you? Go ahead, put that in the comments. Right, so if you're thinking, when you look at these and you look at the blood pressure 208 on 110, that's significant, severe hypertension, they're bradycardic, and they have a breathing rate of six, that's leading to an end tidal CO2 of 60, and finally, of the other concerns is 84% SpO2. So basically, everything that you see here is flashing red because there is a concern there. So absolutely, we have a pretty sick patient that has a lot of multi-problems going on when it comes to their vital signs. So let's kind of talk about what's going on here uh, from this patient's perspective. Okay, so we have a lot of things that are going on here. Now my question to you based off what we see here and the concerns that we have, there, there could be a lot of overwhelming factors with this. And so my question to you right now is, what are the two things that are gonna cause an increase in mortality in head injury patients? What two things, go ahead, Put them in the comments, what two things can cause increased mortality in head injury patients? So this will help us simplify what we need to do in order to give this patient the best chance of survival. Okay, those two things that we need to be looking at and what causes increased mortality is hypoxia and hypotension. So these are the two things. When you have a whole lot of things going on, you have your vitals, your monitor that's going off like crazy with a bunch of things that are, pro that are an issue, you need to be thinking, okay, what is going to be bad for this patient? And the two things that are gonna be bad for this patient are hypoxia and hypotension. So those are the things that we need to address to make sure that we give this patient the best chance of success. So let's break these two down. So first off, we have hypoxia. Now hypoxia in itself is one that we can simply treat with two ways, okay? Two things. First off, we can oxygenate them and we can ventilate them. So one of the questions you need to ask yourself right off the hop is, can they oxygenate or ventilate themselves? If the answer is yes, then we are gonna put a non-rebreather on them, get their oxygen as high as we possibly can, 
and make sure that they are able to get oxygen in there so that way they're not hypoxic. If, however, they are not able to oxygenate or ventilate themselves, then we need to intervene with mechanical ventilation with a BVM and making sure that we have high flow oxygen on this patient. So that would be the first question is, so how do we treat hypoxia? Well, we need to first identify if they can help themselves or if we need to help them. If they can't help themselves, we use a BVM. If they can help themselves by oxygenating and ventilating themselves, we're gonna assist with that by giving a non-rebreather. Okay, so going back to our patient that we have here, can this patient oxygenate and ventilate themselves? Do we have any evidence to suggest one or the other? Go ahead and put that in the comments. Okay, in this particular patient, this patient is showing signs that they cannot ventilate and they cannot oxygenate themselves. They have an SpO2 of 84%, so they are already severely hypoxic. Now, how can we tell that they can't ventilate themselves? Well, they have a breathing rate of 60 or 6, that's below a normal breathing rate, so they're not ventilating themselves appropriately. And their ETCO2 is 60, which means that it's rising. It means that their minute volume is completely limited, meaning that they're not able to get rid of CO2 in their breathing, so they accumulate in their blood. Thus, we see that here. So they're breathing so slow that they're accumulating CO2 and we're seeing that with an ETCO2 number that's significantly higher than what we would like. So in this particular scenario, this patient cannot oxygenate and they cannot ventilate themselves. So we're gonna to have to assist them in that. Okay, so let's move on to hypotension. Now, hypotension is an interesting one, so let's talk a little bit about the physiology of it, and that way you can kind of understand why it's so significant. So the first thing that I'll mention is that the brain itself doesn't hold on to a whole lot of nutrients. It doesn't store nutrients for bad times. It basically uses everything that's delivered to it and gets rid of anything that it doesn't use. So it doesn't have a storage situation for when things get bad, okay? It kind of just depends on the body to deliver oxygen and to deliver nutrients to it at all periods. So it's just that kind of system. So when we do have patients that have hypotension or hypoperfusion to the brain, the brain starts to get very hypoxic very quickly because they have no reserves to pull from in order to sustain themselves. So they start to get very sick very quickly. So when it comes to the perfusion of the brain, it is managed by what we call the cerebral perfusion pressure. That's the CPP number over here. And we need to keep that number above 50 at all times, ideally around 55 in order to create good perfusion in all, um, all situations. So when we have a patient that is has a head injury, what we have is actually an increase in our intracranial pressure. So to kind of determine the difference between the two, your mean arterial pressure is the pressure that's heading towards the brain. Your ICP is pushing against the brain, like so, okay? Pushing back against your mean arterial pressure. So that's why we see MAP minus ICP equals cerebral perfusion pressure, because whatever pr pressure you're left with after this equation is what our brain actually gets. Okay, so this is your back pressure, this is your pressure heading towards the brain. And so in a head injury patient, what occurs is that we actually have a change in our pressures. And so blood starts to escape and our intracranial pressure, the pressure that's pushing back, starts to rise. And when it starts to rise, then we are going, and we don't have an increase our mean arterial pressure, that means that our cerebral perfusion pressure is very low, it goes below 50. Our body does not like that, it's very, very um, stingent on this and it actually will start to compensate very rapidly against this because it wants to oxygenate the brain. So when you have an increase in ICP, your MAP is going to compensate. And so we're gonna increase our map all the way, as high as we possibly can. And by increasing that map as high as we possibly can, that's what gives you your extreme hypertension. It's really a compensation, compensation factor that's increasing in order to bring that CPP number up as high as we possibly can, so that way we're above 50, regardless of what the ICP number is. So when that ICP number rises, our mean arterial pressure rises as well to compensate for it to perfuse the brain.
Okay, so in this particular case, in our patient, they are hypertensive as well. So they're compensating for that as well. But let's say your patient wasn't compensating for it. What if they were getting close to hypotension or they were already hypotensive? How could we treat them? Well, in most situations, we have a few different choices in order to limit the amount of hypotension that we have. And that is using either fluids, norepinephrine, so a vasopressor, and also choosing the proper sedation that's going to limit hypotension. Okay, so let's look at these individually. So fluids itself is going to increase the amount of fluid concentration in here. So it's going to increase the vascular resistance, the pressure against the tube itself. And so by increasing it, it's going to increase the pressure in this tube, thus increasing your blood pressure if you're hypotensive. If you are using norepinephrine, it's going to constrict those blood vessels. So whatever fluid is in there, we're actually going to constrict the blood vessels to increase pressure. And finally, your sedation choice. Now, think about it this way, is that your sedation, a lot of your sedation has uh, vasoactive properties. Versed causes vasodilation. Even fentanyl at higher doses can cause vasodilation. Uh, things like propofol can cause vasodilation. So there's a lot of choices here and one and something that you want to think about is what can my patient handle? If they're already borderline hypotensive, you're probably not best off going with something like Versed and fentanyl or going off with propofol if you're using that. But something that's not nearly as vasoactive is ketamine. Okay, and ketamine doesn't have those vasoactive properties. In fact, it goes the opposite. It causes vasoconstriction because of catecholamine release. And so using a sedation choice that doesn't cause vasodilation to counteract what you're trying to do with fluids and norepinephrine is a big benefit to these patients. So limiting the vasoactive sedation choices and limiting the chances of it causing vasodilation, thus causing hypotension, is something you have to think about if you're choosing to intubate these patients. Okay, so let's talk a few things, a few other things when it comes to head injuries and a lot of different questions that come up is hyperventilation. So my question to you is, should we hyperventilate head injury patients? Go ahead, put that in the comments. Should we hyperventilate head injury patients? Now the answer to the question is probably not. Okay, a lot of head injury patients, we typically don't need to hyperventilate. In fact, most patients we don't. And the reason being is that there's no evidence to suggest that it's actually a benefit with the exception of one particular subset of head injury patients, and that is herniation patients. So when it comes to cerebral herniation, basically the idea is that we're trying to reduce the amount of fluid total volume inside the brain. Okay, so remember we have that really high ICP number and that's because of fluid that's in the brain. If we can decrease the amount of fluid going to the brain, that means that ICP shouldn't rise nearly as much. There should be more space inside the brain. Okay, how do we achieve this goal? Well, what we do it, how we do it is by decreasing CO2. By decreasing CO2 concentrations in the blood, it causes vessel constriction. And by causing vessel constriction, it means that less fluid can be delivered to the brain. That's actually a good thing in these kind of situations because total volume inside the brain is going to uh, cause more ICP rise. Okay, so what does that all mean? Okay. In these particular patients, there was a theory that we should be hyperventilating all of these patients in order to reduce the amount of total volume in the brain. That has recently, or not recently, it's been for the most part debunked. And the evidence shows that it's not a benefit, except in cerebral herniation patients. So patients that have chain stokes breathing, patients that have Cushing's triad with the hypertension, the bradycardia, and the odd breathing, patients that have posturing, patients that have obvious signs of changes in their pupils, all these types of things are indications that we have cerebral herniation occurring. And that's all due to this portion of the brain. Because the ICP is getting so high, it's actually pushing the brain stem through the four magnum, like so. And so it's pushing it all down, causing those symptoms to occur. Those are indications that herniation is happening. And it's all due to a rapid and significant accumulation in the brain itself. Okay, so that's kind of the idea with what's happening. And so what we're trying to do is essentially decrease the CO2 levels. So that way when we decrease the CO2 levels, it's going to cause vessel constriction, meaning that less blood can make it to the brain itself, 
thus hopefully reducing some of the ICP. It's more of a buy you time type of situation. Another buy you time situation is actually raising the head of the stretcher to help for venous bleeding, um, venous uh, removal or drainage so that way more venous blood can get out of the brain easier by using gravity to your assistance. So there's a few things that we can do but should we hyperventilate patients all the time if they have head injuries? No, only if they're showing signs of hyperventilate or uh, showing signs of uh, herniation and in this particular patient we are. So this patient that has extreme hypertension, bradycardia and chain stokes or very ra low breathing, those are really interesting, uh, very consistent, those are signs that this patient is having significant uh, herniation occurring. So in this particular patient, hernia or hyperventilation is indicated in this patient, but again, only in patients that are showing signs of herniation. <coughs> okay, which brings us to another treatment that we are commonly doing now, and it is using hypertonic saline. So to answer that question is, should we be using hypertonic saline in this patient? The answer is probably. I think it could be a benefit to this patient. So let's talk about how that can help your patients. So that way you understand the physiology of what's occurring here. So you have your different compartments inside your brain itself. You have your intracellular fluids, so those cells within the brain itself, that's the fluid inside those cells. You have your extracellular fluid. This is a fluid that's outside the cells, but not in the vascular space because your vascular space is made up of your intravascular fluid. So in a head injury patient, you're going to have an increase in fluid trapped inside the extracellular fluid, like so. And so it's going to put pressure on your brain tissue or your brain cells. And so this is what's going to happen. And when you have this, you're going to have an increase in your ICP. And that is where you're going to have all of these changes that we're seeing with the com compensation of increase in MAP, the decreases in your CPP, all that is going to happen because of this. Okay, so how does 3% saline work? Well, what it does, it's going to increase the sodium concentrations of your intravascular fluid. By doing that, it's going to pull this excess extracellular fluid here into the vascular space. Why does it do that? Because when you cause an increase in sodium, water wants to follow it and try and equalize it. So when we have hypertonic saline that's increasing the concentration of the IVF or intravascular fluid, all of that fluid that's trapped in the ECF or a good portion of it is going to try and pull itself to the IVF and thus drain out of the brain, reducing your ICP. <coughs> So that is how 3% saline is a benefit. Uh, it is shown that it can reduce ICP and it have it can have a pretty sustained effect. And again, more so by time. That's really all we're doing here is we're just buying this patient time to get to the hospital to get definitive treatment is using things like uh, raising the head of the stretcher, uh, making sure that we are getting oxygenation to this patient and ventilation to this patient, making sure that they're not hypotensive, using 3% saline in order to try and reduce some of that ICP. All of these things are designed to buy this patient time. It's not to Ma it's, and to manage this patient, it's not actually to correct this patient. This patient needs surgery and needs ICU time. And that is, and all we're doing is just giving them a chance to survive all of these injuries by doing these treatments and keeping them from being hypotensive and hypoxic. So hopefully you enjoyed this quick little class on head injuries and understand some of the physiology that's going on. If you have any questions about this, please feel free to reach out. We're more than happy to chat. Again, we would love to you to become Master Medics members, so please don't be shy. Go ahead and do that. Join up for at least a three-day trial. Check it out if it's for you, and if it's not, you can cancel again anytime you want, uh, but we would love to have you. So thanks again for joining me, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>